Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Good to see you all here. Um, <coughs> today, I continue uh, in a series that many people have been doing over the year of uh, a series you can see that we want to ask how should we live as Christians. So this is a practical series. <coughs> and my uh, topic today is on keeping in step with the Spirit. And I, I've also subtitled it to choose to live your life in Christ. And it's based on Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 to 26. And if you have your Bibles, it would be great if you have a look at it. Uh, and this is what it says. <clears throat> and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So very quickly, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to share the basic outline so that you can actually follow uh, better. It's, it's quite simple, really. This is a topical sub topic. Uh, it's first thing I want to talk about is to understand the context of the phrase, keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, context is very important. Uh, and maybe we do biblical studies, we have this saying called, uh, context is king. <coughs> Take things out of context and you won't understand it well. And then I want to handle just basically three truths <coughs> that I want you to remember as we go on the journey. The first one is that you belong to Christ. The second one is that grace, even though you're saved by grace, it requires disciplined living. And the third thing I want to remind you is that the Holy Spirit is here to help us, to help you. And then I will just close some reflections on these topics, and hopefully that we will be able, honestly, to keep in step with the Spirit. So let's look at the context. Uh, very quickly, the context of verses 24 to 25, which I've read, uh, is actually interesting. It's a conclusion of the contrasting list of vices and virtues. That's why I want you, if you have your Bible, it's fantastic. If you look at it, you will see before it, verses 19, to 21, you read about a list of things that bring death. And let me just quickly read to you. It says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these things and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then the list follows with something called the fruit of the Spirit. Many of you were aware of it, and it's another contrasting list. But it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then we have the verses about those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I want you to notice again, like I mentioned, there are three things that you need to remember. And I, want, and I hope it drills into your mind and your heart. You belong to Christ. <clears throat> you are saved by grace through faith. But grace requires discipline, responsible living. And I'll explain that as we go along. And the third thing which quite a number of people sadly forget is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's here to help us. So let's talk about the three truths. <clears throat> the first one is this. You belong to Christ. Now, if you have <clears throat> come to the saving knowledge of Christ, if you understand what it means to receive Christ into your life and become a child of God, you belong to Christ. Now, what does that mean? If you look at verse 24, this is what it says, and I, and I put it there, and as usual, I want you to see for some people who like to follow the, the highlighted parts. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. This is how you know. If you really belong to Christ, this is what you've done. And, and, and the phrase belong to Christ is such a beautiful phrase. It's just a simple thing in Greek. It's... It, 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 the, the grammar basically says, you know, it's a possessive. In other words, it's simply saying that when you say you belong to Christ, you are Christ's possessions. Can you imagine? That's why you read out through the Bible, you're not your own anymore, you belong to Christ. So Christ owns you. 
And if that is true, and he says you have crucified the flesh. And again, grammar is so important because this tense says this, it is a single action in the past. It happened. When you became a Christian, you were crucified. It is tense. It's a single action in the past, but the effect is carried forward to the present and the future. So that one action by faith in God, you crucified your the flesh and now you belong to Christ. Now and forever. And then it mentions that now you have a new life and a relationship with Christ. Because like I mentioned, it happened when you died with Christ. And this is what we read. Remember the very popular verse that many of you will know. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I know some of you have memorized it when you were young. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a crucifixion happening. <clears throat> and so therefore, you belong to Christ. You're no longer <clears throat> the old person. So what does that really mean now? <clears throat> because later we'll look at it and realize that if that's true, then why are so many of us struggling, right? As if we've got no new life. Well, the point is, the text is telling us that grace still requires disciplined living. It says that if we live by the Spirit, it means we have the Spirit. And if you read through Galatians, you, and if you find a lot of talk about in Christ, in the Spirit, with the Spirit, by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit if we live by the Spirit. So the question is really asking now, he's actually throwing a rhetorical question. He's asking if, do you live by the Spirit? Do you live by the Spirit? How do you know? Do you have a relationship with Christ? If your answer is yes, it's basically saying, then you should keep in step with the Spirit. And it's quite obvious that people are not. And that's why you have these two big lists. And it's saying, I've told you before, I'm telling you, and I told you before that you live this way. It's death. You, you, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I warn you, he says, and I warned you before, but you're not listening. See, to live by the Spirit, therefore, is to have new life in Christ because we know throughout the Bible, especially with those who know John chapter 3, the very famous passage that you are born again by how? How, do I, how am I born again? By the Spirit. The Spirit gives new life. So if that is true, <clears throat> you must have new life. So the question now is, why aren't we living that? Why are we so ill-disciplined? And so now it's asking now, it's not works, by the way. Remember, he's saying, look, it's logical. And then he brings up in verse 25, that key phrase, which is part of the sermon topic, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, there are more than two roles of the Holy Spirit in our life. You read through the Bible. I just want to highlight two that you probably know about, and it's easy to remember. First one is, one of the roles of the Spirit is to teach us and remind us. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus told his disciples, this is what he said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It's the Spirit who reminds us, the Spirit who teaches us. <clears throat> and we won't, he's saying you're not keeping a step with the Spirit. You already have the Spirit. Why aren't you? <clears throat> you know, right? The second one is the power. Spirit provides grace and power in our weaknesses. And again, a very, very popularly well-known verse is this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He said to me, remember Paul was complaining? He's got his issues and things, he's talking to God, praying, why, why, help me take away these things. He says that my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, he says now, all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest in me. When he reached that conclusion, he realizes, so I'm, maybe I got ill health, I've got to struggle with this, I've got physical disability and things, but I will praise God. <clears throat> I will praise God. The, because grace is sufficient. 
And honestly, I mean, I, I don't like to put people on pedestal, but I mean, you all know me. She called me last night to, because I checked on her. Hey, mom, okay. I said, what's happening? She's still laughing and she's saying, I said, you okay? A little bit better, still in the hospital. She said, I can't lie down anymore because I can't breathe. The virus is so bad. She's actually said, I got, a, I got a lazy boy to sleep on. I said, you mean the hospital gives you a lazy boy? I said, yep. Are you okay? Yeah, just, she's just smiling. And she said, yes, you know, uh, well, they treat me well, you know, praise God. Always talk about Christ sharing. She never complained anything about her weaknesses and problems. Always upbeat. Let's look on the past. Let's praise God. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Amazing, isn't it? But that is a sign that you are keeping step of the Spirit, that you have the Spirit of God in you. So basically, it's to choose to live your life in Christ. And I want you to again look at it. <clears throat> I want you to see if you go through the passage, you will see this thing coming up. So I put up the passage down there, and I just want to see, this is in Galatians, I want you to see what I underline in bold. These are emphasis. Walk by the Spirit is contrasted with you will not gratify desire of the Spirit. Verse 16. You see the difference? <coughs> just telling you, look. The desires of the flesh, we just read, are opposed to the desires of the Spirit. Now, when I say <coughs> focus in the passage, I, I can't explain because my, my ability in Greek grammar is not very good. It's sufficient to understand a lot of things. But I have a system in, the, in, in my Bible software where it actually I, I put something in that helps me to understand when in the text certain things come out means the way it's phrased, the clauses, the way it's phrased in the sentence, that these are the things that it's pointing at. Does that make sense? So it's actually telling you in, in, in grammar, these are the things that kind of highlight the text. Walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Opposed, opposed, they are different. Those be led by the Spirit is highlighted. You're not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident. And, and that is such a strong thing. I was sharing that with the Chinese service. I said, do I even need to interpret and explain this thing after the person is translated? No. Well, Paul was saying, do you mean you need to me to explain to you uh, sexual immoral immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger? Do you need an explanation? You don't need. It's quite evident. And then that warning, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is stressed. Then the reminder, verse 24, that the flesh, this thing, flesh, is crucified. And then that call, let us keep in step the Spirit. Now, I say this because sometimes we hear people speaking against the disciplined Christian life, saying, oh, that's about works, not grace. You know, you, you cannot talk about that. You, got, you misunderstand. <clears throat> Apostle Paul always talks about you are saved by grace. It's by faith in God, not your works. You can't boast about it. But then he brings up, all these things to say that if you are a Christian, you really know Christ, okay, and you say you live by the Spirit, how come is you living like that? There's something wrong. And here's the thing. You see, I like this story by the late Tim Keller. And, and it's this real story he tells about this woman. <coughs> so just listen to the story and... and See whether it makes sense to you. He wrote this. He wrote this. Some years ago, I met with a woman who began coming to church at Redeemer. That's the name of his church. And I never heard a distinction drawn between gospel and religion. That is, she, she never understood the difference between grace and a work-based righteousness, you know? <coughs> they say I'm a grace, but everybody thinks it's about, I need to do something so God loves me, right? <coughs> and this is interesting. She said, she'd always heard that God accepts us only if we are good enough. And then she comes to this church and she hears a different message and she's amazed. She said that, she said that the new message <coughs> was scary about grace. I asked why it was scary and she replied, this is a, this is a, if I was saved by my good words, then there will be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. I would be like a taxpayer with rights. I have done my duty, and now I deserve a certain quality of life. Make sense? 
After all, I, I, I work here, so I, I've got some rights. But now she says, but I am a sinner saved by grace. And this is where she gets it right and many people get it wrong. She says, then there is nothing he cannot ask of me. See, many people think I'm saved by grace, therefore I don't want to do anything. You know, it's a free pass. I don't have to, you know, if I feel, don't feel like coming to church, I don't. I don't feel like reading the Bible, I don't read. I don't feel like praying, I don't pray. I don't feel like sharing other people, I don't share. Because I've got this passed by grace. It's not works. She understood, he said, if I am a sinner saved by grace, then there's nothing he cannot ask of me. And she understood the dynamic of grace and gratitude. She knew that if she was a sinner saved by grace, she was, if anything, more subject to the sovereign lordship of God. She knew that if Jesus had done all this for her, she would not be her own. She would joyfully, gratefully belong to Jesus who provided this for her and anything else. The infinite cost. This is understanding what grace is. I belong to Christ, now she says. He done everything for me. He's my sovereign lord. Amazing, isn't it? <coughs> a younger person in faith understood this concept, which evades many older Christians. So what is the meaning of keeping in step with the Spirit? You know why I say it's discipline? It literally means to march with the Spirit. That's the term. It's a military term, meaning to be drawn up in line. You stand in the line in a row, and then when you ask, Move, you march. <coughs> it is to behave according to God's standards. And God says, <coughs> go, you go. Do this, you do this. That's the concept. That's the concept. And we need to grasp that. This is the choice of a disciplined life in the Spirit. I'm now a believer. I've come to Christ by grace I love my God, He's done it with me. Now, God, what do you want me to do? I will listen. This actually allows the Spirit to bestow His grace upon us and to actually empower us. And then people say, well, I, I don't really know what the Spirit wants, right? We know. <clears throat> the earlier verses I just read tells us the works of the flesh, the fruit of the Spirit, what does God want? They're opposed. God says, well, I don't want you to live and do the things that are the works of the flesh. Your flesh, you've been crucified now. You're part of a new reality, a new life. If we actually start to realize and reject all these things, they are so evident, as he says, then we're really starting to walk. And if we start to chase after, ask God, help me with this fruit of the Spirit I want to experience the love, joy, peace. I want to experience patience. I want to feel kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. I want these things, God. Then we're beginning to walk and keep a step to the Spirit. And here's the thing that really, really struck to me, the warning. If the works of the flesh characterize your life, if you have no change in your life, you're living as you are, in the old ways, you do not have the Spirit. It cannot be. Jesus is the most blunt. He says, hey, good tree will have good fruit. Bad tree will have bad fruit. Okay, a good tree cannot have good fruit. So don't, don't give me that stuff. All right, so if that's the case, then you don't have the Spirit. You don't have life. If you don't have life, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're going to die in your sins. So does that sound like, oh, we're being so harsh, you know, you... No, he's telling reality is logic. If, <coughs> therefore, you should be. If you live by the Spirit, then keep in step with the Spirit. So why do we feel powerless sometimes? Okay, I'm not hitting down on people. Say, oh, but you know, I struggle. I struggle so much. I'll tell you a couple of things. The first one is when we grieve the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Let me read to you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And what's the context? You go back and read the context, Ephesians is telling is about a person who chooses to live according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. 
you have a choice. <coughs> you have a choice. You've come to Christ, but you still have a choice, and the people are choosing to live a certain way. <coughs> that is wrong. And he's saying when you do that, you grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a power. He's powerful. He is a person. He is the Trinity. He's one, to one of the <laughs> of God the Spirit calling him. Okay, one of the three persons of the Godhood. <coughs> okay, he gets hurt. The second one we notice is when we quench the Spirit. That term comes from First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter five, verse nineteen. Do not quench the Spirit. And that concept really is it, the idea in the context is, is resisting the work of the Spirit. One is. I just ignore, I do what I want to do, and it's wrong. I know it's wrong. The other one is the Spirit is telling us things to do. I don't want to. <coughs> I resist. He's saying, go, go. I want you to go and talk to that person. I want you to talk to the person, be it that person's friend. I've got something to say to the person. No, I'm so shy. <coughs> things like that. You will know. <coughs> And of course, the third one I want to emphasize, which is very part of this text, is when we try to deal with sin apart from the Holy Spirit. See, I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Think about that again. If you walk by the Spirit, you're following the Spirit, you're letting the Spirit empower you to teach you, to remind you, to help you, to give you the grace you need, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's one of the problems. We try to do it on our own strength. <coughs> and let me give you a very great example I found. It's the reality of life really is this, right? You think about it. If you try to remove sin from your life, which you should want to, right? Without the grace of God, without the power of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you are doomed to fail. <coughs> this is a very interesting illustration. There's a person called Arika Hayashaki who wrote a book, Secret Life of the Professor Who Lives with Nazis. <clears throat> now, I haven't read the book, uh, but I've got all the extracts of this. <clears throat> and, and she tells a story. And this, I'm going to read you the story, what she says. For the last 20 years, sociologist Peter Simi has spent time with and studied white supremacist groups and individuals. Many groups such as the white Aryan resistance, the Nazi, Nazi lowriders, and public enemy number one have allowed him as an observer into their private meetings. Simi explains how difficult it is for those leaving the groups. And then he gives this example. Excuse me. He said a young woman named Bonnie and her husband were fully indoctrinated and committed to white supremacist beliefs. In a domestic dispute unrelated to the white power group, a relative shot their daughter. <coughs> so can you imagine that? <coughs> At the hospital, two black doctors saved her life. <coughs> and that changed Bonnie and her husband, who tried to retrain their minds, free themselves of racist views. <coughs> so if you don't, you can guess the concept. Basically, we hate the blacks. Black should die, they're worse than animals, so on. And now, two black doctors saved the daughter's life. And so that, that's, you know, like, wow. <coughs> and so we begin to say that something wrong with our beliefs. <coughs> and they're trying to change, okay? <coughs> they even went so far as to move to a nearby South Carolina area with numerous black and Latino families. So they actually relocated. <coughs> and they're doing their very best. They want to change. Things became undone one day when Bonnie realized she had received the wrong order after going through a local drive through restaurant. The clerk refused to correct the order when she went inside. All the workers were Mexican and didn't speak good English. And Bonnie became enraged and swore at the clerk, told her to get out of the country, exclaiming, white power, and left displaying the Nazi salute. Now, after the eruption, Bonnie collapsed in a car outside of the restaurant crying asking herself, why did she do that? Why had she reverted to a state of hate that she'd been trying to push away? It was clear to Simi that she felt shame about how she reacted. Simi believed that for many, being part of a white power group becomes like an addiction. 
Those who try to quit hating usually will relapse because racism burrows deep into the psyche and merely leaving the group cannot expunge it. Simi called this the hangover effect. He has tried to get mental health services for some of the white supremacists who are on the fence about leaving <coughs> or have already left their hate group. Now here's the one, the kicker. But few counsellors will agree to take them on. Why? Simi said the response is we're not qualified. <coughs> it's too difficult. <coughs> we can't help them. They may be professionals, <coughs> licensed therapists or whatever. Uh-uh. We're not touching it. It's too difficult. And that's the reality, isn't it? None of us are qualified. We can't get sin out of our life without the Holy Spirit. So only the Holy Spirit can set us free. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. I send the Holy Spirit to do what? To be a helper. To come alongside you, to empower you, to give you the help. Keep in step with the Spirit. He will break us free. That's the core news of salvation in Christ, right? That's what we always teach you. You come to, how do you come to Christ? I admit I'm a sinner. <coughs> I'm messed up. God help me. By faith and grace, we ask God and Jesus comes to our life and then we are changed and the Spirit comes to lift us and then the power grows. The peace comes. Only when we say we need God, we can't do it alone. Religion can't help me. My words can't help me. God, I need you. That happens. See, when we keep a step the Spirit, through a disciplined life, then we actually find and experience freedom. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> now, I want to continue now how he ends in verse 26, the dangers of pride and disunity. Paul closes this whole chapter with something interesting. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And if you actually look through the passage, think, that doesn't seem to fit, right? I mean, you're hitting a very good point and then now you're kind of like, Drop back to a quick summary, some stuff that seems unrelated, kind of a sub point. But it's actually very important. Keeping in step with the Spirit is also about unity and common purpose. And she looked at the church, she knew this was happening. Think about the facts. How was the church born? How did it all happen? <clears throat> Holy Spirit came, right? Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit gave birth to the church. <clears throat> What did the Spirit do? You read throughout the Bible, things like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He gave us gifts. <clears throat> he gave us spiritual gifts. To do what? For the common good. Not for yourself, not for me. It's that we help one another, we are together. What is it about the Spirit? He talks about the fact that we all are the body of Christ. We all, you know, we cannot say one is greater than the other. We need one another. And then he talks, and he goes after chapter 12, that famous passage, chapter 13, right? Love. <clears throat> Let me read to you how he ends chapter 12. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still more excellent way. After settling all that, and then he talks about the well passage on love. And then he ends. So now faith, hope, and love abide. But these three... But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> what did Jesus say? Summarizes all the commands of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> okay? And the church did that. The early church demonstrated that unity and love. They shared. Read the famous passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. They had all things in common. They were selling possessions, belongings, distributing of proceeds among those poor who needed it. Day by day, they entered, attending the temple together. They broke bread in their homes, received food with glad and generous hearts. They were so happy. They were there, and then God began to bless. <coughs> See, when the Spirit seeks to help us keep his step with him, he does it as us as individuals, but also as a community. So you are definitely not in step with the Spirit. <clears throat> Sorry to say, if there's a lot of disunity and fight and bitterness and fighting and, and envy, conceit, provoking one another, it doesn't work. I think that's why Paul added that way. <clears throat> a community. That's the proof. <clears throat> so let's look at some applications.
The first one is this, I want you to be sure you're in Christ. Be sure that you are born again and that Spirit actually lives in you. <coughs> and I love this great <coughs> old school Christian uh, psychologist. He's very famous for people of my age, you know, <coughs> Archibald Hart. He says, without regeneration, all human efforts to improve the quality of life, mental or physical, are limited. <coughs> no regeneration. You're just fighting. And I want you to think about this. What does it mean to be born again? Concept. <clears throat> born, so you're new, right? And I was being the thing, it's like, you know, it's like a new genetic makeup. <clears throat> and then I found this fantastic report. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you. A news report in the year 2000 had a very interesting discovery. This is what it said. Researchers found discovered that certain people are genetically destined to excel in athletics. According to their study, there's this gene called the ACE gene. It's longer, I guess you know the, the length of it, it's longer in athletes in, than in those who are not agile, fast or well coordinated in their movements. So obviously my ACE gene is very, very short. <clears throat> okay? But researchers also found out, observed that people who are born with a longer ACE gene, which means they are genetically disposed to be faster, you know, like speed and all that, must work out to take advantage of the hereditary advantage. If they don't do it, it's the same. <coughs> Makes sense? So we are born again in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So in a real sense, we have this genetic makeup. The Spirit is there with us. But we will never, never excel in glorifying God and growing if we don't take the effort to be disciplined <coughs> spiritually, right? We now have that natural and greater power over sin because of the power of God. But where's the discipline? Okay, <coughs> second one is this. When you choose Christ, you are choosing life. Think about it, true? <clears throat> That's why he became a Christian, right? But here's the problem is why is it that so many people that profess Christ, but who maybe who are really Christians, you know, really have Christ in their life. I'm not talking of those who say they are, but obviously they're not. <clears throat> okay, just fooling yourself. I'm saying the genuine one, like, you know, maybe some of you say, but that's me. <clears throat> I really have received Christ. Praise the Lord. But why am I struggling? Why am I choosing this sinful life instead of God's life? <clears throat> I want to tell you a story which I've told, I think maybe 10 years ago in church. <clears throat> but this is one of the stories that has never left me. In 2004, <clears throat> there was a New York Times article by a man called uh, Nicholas Christophe, and the title was very interesting. It was called Bargaining for Freedom. Now, he was a New York Times reporter, and he was basically given the task to write this story <coughs> and be some resources, all right? He writes now how he chose two Cambodian prostitutes and he attempted to buy their freedom from the brothel owners. He selected young men, women, sorry, who were against their will, willing to tell their story, obviously, because, you know, it's going to be for a report, and actually wanted to leave prostitution. Okay, so those are the criteria. The first woman, Srinet, was a simple transaction. For $150 US, Christoph left with the girl and a receipt. <coughs> Easy, right? So he paid the brothel owner, she got a girl. The second one, Shremon, proved very difficult because the brothel owner wanted more money. <coughs> Never mind. After some grumpy, he writes this, after some grumpy negotiation, the owner accepted 203 US dollars as the price for stray mom's freedom. Now guess what happened next? But then, stray mom told me she had pawned her cell phone and needed 55 US dollars to get it back. <coughs> you just got your freedom and you're thinking about your cell phone. <coughs> So he writes, forget about your cell phone. I said, we've got to get out of here. And Shreemom started crying. 
I told her she had to choose her cell phone or her freedom. So what do you think she did? Any guesses? <coughs> she ran back to her tiny room in the brothel and locked the door. <coughs> with stray mom sobbing in her room and refusing to be free without her cell phone, the other prostitutes, her closest friends, began pleading with her to be reasonable. <coughs> and here's the kicker. Even the brothel owner begged her, grab this chance while you can. But stray mom hysterically refused to leave. <coughs> he said stray mom only stopped crying when Christoph agreed to buy back the cell phone too. You think that's over now? <laughs> then she asked for a pawn jewelry to be part of the deal. <coughs> and this is what he said. Christoph said, I reflected upon the complex emotions making the decision to leave the brother. Why make it so difficult? And he says, I purchased the freedom of two human beings so I can return them to the villages. But will emancipation help them? Will their families and villages accept them? Or will they, like some other girls rescued from sexual servitude, find freedom so unsettling that they sling back the slavery and the brothels? And he ends his article, we'll see. Now, do you realize that this actually is how many Christians live our lives? Think about it. Christ has set us free <coughs> from sin and death. Give us new life. But then we go back and choose to <coughs> live in slavery because we prefer that better rather than the newness of life. So sadly, we find that many people live to gratify the desires of the flesh, as Paul said, even knowing it brings death. Why did Apostle Paul have to say, I warn you? And I warned you before. Why? Why are you doing this? So I'm asking the question now for all of us. <coughs> this is what we are doing. And we are really going to ask hard questions yourself. Do you really want that freedom, that the joy, and that peace? Then be disciplined and follow God. Third one <coughs> is where I end. Focus on God. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we do this? Simple thing I'll just say to you is this. Focus on God, not your sinful weaknesses. The more we focus on all the struggles we're having, the harder it is because we can get overwhelmed, especially for those who have, you know, a huge list. <coughs> you know, you get overwhelmed. I, I, you know, I got this problem, I got this, I got that, and it, it just blows your mind. And again, my, my well, basically one of my favorite authors, Henry Nowell, this advice he gave years ago I read, has helped me so much in my life. For decades it's helped me. And this is what he says. I cannot continuously say no to this or no to that unless there's something ten times more attractive to choose. Saying no to my lusts, my greed, my needs and the world's power takes an enormous amount of energy. You find it true? <coughs> right? And he says the only hope is to find something so obviously real and attractive that I can devote all my energies to saying yes. And he says, one such thing I can say yes to is when I come in touch with the fact that I am loved. Once I found that in my total brokenness, I'm still loved, I become free from the compulsion of doing successful things. That was his struggle. And that's exactly why I saying. Keep your step to the Spirit. You, you follow. Focus on the Spirit. Walk as He says. And a lot of stuff is just going to fade. And you're not going to be overwhelmed. So seek the Spirit. Seek the fruits. And remember again the, what the roles of the Spirit. Two roles I reminded you. He's a teacher. Right? The provider of grace and power. He's a reminder, you know, reminder of things. And remember, the Holy Spirit is always available. He's always there. He's never left us. But if we grieve Him, according, choosing to live according to the flesh, then we're in trouble. The voice becomes softer and softer. If we quench the Spirit by resisting when He's telling us to do something, we miss the opportunities. Right? The voice becomes softer and softer. Because like someone said wisely, the Holy Spirit, you know, never, never 
so to speak, nags us, yells at us, scolds us. He's always gently. He's a comforter, reminding us. He's a gentleman, so to speak. And the last one, which I don't have time to develop, I'll just end with it. Can you think of the Holy Spirit as a coach? <laughs> I, I like that concept because, you know, when we do mentoring concepts and things, I say many people forget this beautiful concept. It's a coach. He's always cheering me on. Come on, Paul, you can do it. Ah, oh, no, you messed up. Okay, get up, get up. Let's do it. Let's go again. And I find this wonderful. Think about that. Like a coach telling us how to run, prepare, listen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. <clears throat> we believe we have the Spirit. You live in us. You give us new life. Help us to consider the fact that if we <laughs> have the Spirit of God, if we live by the Spirit, then help us keep in step with the Spirit. Teach us, help us, encourage us not to get down. Focus on you. Realize, Lord, that you love us, you're there for us, and you will help us. May we find the freedom, may we find the victory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.